Okay, I think the, the music stopped, so that uh, must mean that we're ready to start. Uh, welcome everybody um, to this UK Prevention Research Partnership webinar on the commercial determinants of health and health uh, inequalities. Uh, next slide, please. So um, my name is uh, David Crosby. I'm the Head of Prevention and Early Detection Research at Cancer Research UK, uh, one of the funders of the UK Prevention Research Partnership. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today for this, uh, this webinar. Next slide, please. A little housekeeping before we start. Um, this uh, meeting is being recorded. Um, which uh, you're, you're pretty prompted to, uh, to, to uh, acquiesce to at the start at the uh, top of the screen there. Uh, please do keep yourselves on mute when not speaking uh, and please keep your cameras off uh, such that the, the speakers uh, faces will be highlighted at the top of the screen. Please uh, submit questions uh, throughout for our speakers so um, we'll, I'll, I'll introduce our speakers in a moment but um, Whilst the talks are happening, you have the ability to submit questions for them, uh, which I can then field. Um, those questions we'd like you to submit using uh, the Slido uh, format. So the um, web address is there on your screen, that's slido.com. And when you go to that site, please then enter the event code uh, hashtag 001948 as on screen currently. Um, I believe Megan has also posted those details into the Teams meeting chat um, that is, is accessible by the, to the uh, speech bubble at the top of the screen. Um, you can submit questions there in writing. Those will come through to me uh, and then I'll, I'll um, read them out for the speakers uh, when we have our panel discussion after the two talks. Uh, closed captioning is available. Um, you can find uh, the link to that also in the chat box. Um, if you have any questions at all, if, if, um, if things aren't working for you technically, uh, please get in touch with the uh, webinar events team, uh, events at synergy.co.uk. Next slide, please. So the agenda for today, um, I'll be giving a brief introduction and telling you a little about the background of the UK PRP initiative uh, and then the purpose of today's webinar. Um, I'll then have the distinct uh, pleasure of introducing our uh, two speakers, Professors uh, Linda Bold and Neve Short. Um, we'll then, after those two talks, open it up for um, Q&A and discussion that I'll be facilitating. And then we'll, we'll wrap things up um, by uh, 1.30. Thank you, next slide. So what is the UK Prevention Research Partnership? Well, this is a 55 uh, million pound multi-funder initiative. Um, it involves uh, the uh, major research um, charities, health research charities in the UK, working uh, in close partnership with the um, government and you know, the public funded uh, research bodies across all four nations um, to, to really bring together a collaborative effort to address the, um, the upstream um, determinants of health and uh, understanding the challenges and, and developing interventions to prevent disease and to, to maintain health um, across uh, NCDs um, uh, and, and to reduce health inequalities. Next slide, please. Um, just to give you a brief sense of, of what's covered across this initiative, I shan't um, go through each one of these uh, individually, but we, uh, through the UK Prevention Research Partnership, we funded um, a series of large research consortia, uh, for example, the, the Spectrum, Spectrum program that Linda is going to be talking about today, um, and also a series of um, smaller but still, still substantial network awards um, to develop earlier phase um, uh, concepts, um, with the large consortia having multi-million pound uh, budgets to, to develop and deliver a very large scale coordinated programs of research to explore um, the, the upstream determinants of health and ill health and develop interventions to address those. Uh, next slide please. Um, we, funded, we funded a second wave um, of these awards recently um, with some examples here including um, programs to understand the impact of uh, urban green and blue spaces on the prevention of uh, NCDs. Um, the, uh, the, the these awards are um, have been announced very recently and are, and are just um, spinning up as we speak, uh, which is really exciting to have a, a second tranche of funding um, through through the the combined funders. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, what are we talking about here today? Um, this webinar is the third in a series of four, um, which are happening 
uh, over the, the the previous and the next month or two, um, the, the primary aim of which is to um, really share emerging learning from the first round of UKPRP funded projects um, to to engage with a wider audience to you know disseminate um, the key signals that are coming from those investments, uh, and but also to have you know an, an interesting discussion around the challenges and and the the emerging um, uh, interventions. Um, We'll be telling you a little bit um, about the next upcoming webinar at the end of this event. Um, we know, uh, of course, that the condition in which we're born, we grow, we live, we work and we age are key drivers of health and health inequalities. And that environment very much includes uh, commercial determinants of health and health inequalities. And you know, the, the, the uh, next slide, please. The, the, the factors which often pre predispose to ill health and non-communicable disease, um, including the, the obvious commodities uh, such as tobacco, alcohol, and unhealthy foods are very much you know part of the environment that, that shapes us and our health and whilst uh, you know these are known uh, risk factors um, there's also uh, very strong commercial incentives around their um, continued use and so to understand the environment around those and and, and you know the, the the levers and drivers of, of their promotion production and use uh, is a crucial challenge um, if we're to most effectively and equitably drive down disease incidents and, and maintain public health. So uh, today we've got uh, speakers from, from the Spectrum um, UKPRP consortium who are going to share uh, latest evidence um, to, to inform the prevention of NCDs uh, caused by these unhealthy commodities, um, you know, and then the web of um, commercial uh, forces at play around those and, and then how um, that understanding can translate to um, evidence-based policy decisions to, to combat their ill effects and, and, uh, and, and maintain health. Next slide, please. So uh, without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Linda Bold. Um, Linda is the Bruce and John Usher Chair in Public Health at the College of Medicine at the uh, University of Edinburgh. Um, she's also re uh, recently been appointed the Chief Social Policy Advisor to the Scottish Government. Uh, Linda is a behavioural scientist whose research focuses on the evaluation of public health interventions and how um, evidence can inform public health policy. Uh, Linda, uh, welcome. Thank you very much, David, and it's lovely to be here. Um, I think it's great uh, two years into Spectrum to have this opportunity to share a little bit about our consortium and also the wider context within which we're working. Um, so I'm going to give some introductory remarks for a number of minutes. And then obviously, Professor Short will be highlighting some of the work that she's leading in one of our particular work packages. So I'll just uh, share my slides. I'll just take a second. So hopefully you're able to see those. Um, what I'm going to cover briefly is talk about the current challenge, uh, which all of you are very aware of. And I see a number of colleagues from Spectrum and also other UK PRP consortia and others have joined us. Thank you. Um, then I'll define what is the commercial determinants of health. Many of you know that, but just go over that. And then introduce what Spectrum is and where we've come from, what our origins are, who's involved in the consortium and our various work packages and how we're approaching the work. Then I'll highlight very briefly three examples of recent studies or pieces of work uh, with useful findings. Um, and then try and reflect on a few what I regard as opportunities within the current context. So everyone knows, but it's important that we keep saying that non-communicable diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, respiratory conditions, and others still account for almost 90% of deaths in the UK and 70% globally. That's the case even in a pandemic. And people living with NCDs are at increased risk when we have an infectious disease outbreaks. Um, and we've seen that from the data that Isaric and some of the other big consortiums have produced around looking at risk factors for COVID-19. Um, but importantly now, uh, you know, for our young people, for example, who are into their third academic year of disruption, we know that services have been fundamentally affected and we have a huge task as we look ahead to recovery. So significant disruption and this has exacerbated the, N the NCD burden. And I was just having a look again today at the, the really excellent summary that I do commend to you on the CRUK website. And I'm not just saying that because David is here, uh, which is a series of slides which quantifies the impact on cancer patients and cancer services. 
during the pandemic. Diabetes UK and others have produced similar material. So for example, even if you look in recent months, the diagnosis of stage one and stage two cancer cases is down by about a quarter. So these are missed opportunities for early intervention, accounting in England for around 25,000 people. And during 2020, we know that general practice referrals for cancer were down by almost 30%, screening down by over half. So these are uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people across the country who've been affected. But there's also a public health backlog and key improvement health services have been paused. Um, that includes drug and alcohol services, smoking cessation, weight management, sexual health, things that people have not been able to access either at all or in the normal way. And important population policies that governments were going to introduce were delayed or not taken forward. So I think there's three things we need to do. Continue to deal with the pandemic, which is still with us. Restart and strengthen efforts, efforts to address NCDs, including the upstream determinants that I'll come on to. And could, can, importantly, contribute to efforts globally to address COVID-19 uh, recovery. And I just wanted to highlight this uh, infographic. I'm sure the slides will be available. I don't expect you to be able to see all the detail now. But this was work published last year by my colleagues from Edinburgh in the BMJ just trying to illustrate some of the direct and indirect impacts of COVID-19. And you can see on this side, on the left side of my screen, the dire directly attributable morbidity and mortality from uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus and COVID-19, the disease, and then all the indirect health harms that have accumulated through the experiences that people have had. And these health and social harms, I think will take far longer for us to address um, and they, you know, they are crucially important. So what is the commercial determinants of health? Now, some of you will have seen this slide, which actually Professor Dame Sally McIntyre used when UK PRP was first being established. And this just illustrates that you can intervene upstream to try and um, prevent some of what will happen downstream when the health service is effectively picking up the pieces of things where we could have intervened earlier. And the commercial determinants of, of health is part of that. So one definition is strategies and approaches, sorry, misspelling there, used by the private sector to promote products and choices that are detrimental to health. It operates at different levels and is relevant locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. It includes consumer and health behavior um, because unhealthy commodity producers of the kind that David highlighted often emphasize individual choices versus other strategies and also wider level issues around globalization and the global consumer society. And we've seen that in relation to the discussions around COP26 and climate change. Commercial actors are writ large in these difficult debates. And research and practice on the commercial determinants of health aims to address the drivers and challenges, channels through which corporations propagate the NCD pandemic. Now, commercial actors have a hugely important role to play in many aspects of health and health care. Uh, we wouldn't have many of the medicines and interventions that we have today without their work, and, and uh, we all are aware of that. But when it comes to unhealthy commodities, the situation is different. So the rationale for a commercial determinants of health focus for us in Spectrum is that policy interventions that operate at the population level, and those can be addressing what we call the four Ps, the price, promotion, um, availability, so that's place, or the content, the products of unhealthy commodities. They've not been adequately examined compared to other aspects of public health in their system level impacts on markets, producers themselves, for example, food producers or alcohol producers, social practices and institutions. We also recognize in Spectrum that evidence is just one factor that influences policy change. Political and public support are also necessary. And that is absolutely the case. Unhealthy commodity producers often derail or delay effective public health policies and practices. And we've seen that over the years with smoke-free public places for tobacco alone, standardized packaging, alcohol minimum unit pricing, which took five years to even just get through the courts. There are multiple examples. So on spectrum, um, we came from a foundation of uh, two previous consortia, the UK Centre for Tobacco Control Studies that we established from 2008 and had nine universities. We had five years of funding um, from the UK Clinical Research Collaboration, which CREK and others were also part of. And then a second quinquennium, we expanded to alcohol and to 13 universities. And then Spectrum is again um, 
a refocusing of that initial platform of work to um, address what we saw as an issue which we hadn't really had enough uh, attention paid to in the earlier consortia, which was uh, these commercial determinants and the activities of these commercial actors and also how we can support intervention and policy change. So our vision is to conduct innovative research that transforms understanding of commercial drivers and systems that cause NCDs and to translate findings into prevention policy and practice and specifically to investigate the conduct and influence of these producers and I see we have at least one colleague from the University of Bath listening and of course Professor Anna Gilmore and, and others for many years have have really done combined what is investigative journalism with research to look at and um, what, what these companies are actually doing to undermine policies or influence governments. Build understanding of the systems that perpetuate these drivers. So for example, our colleague Mark Pettigrew at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is looking at how alcohol marketing operates as a system. It's not just that you see an advert and you think, oh, I must buy this. It changes our social norms. It normalizes consumption and affects um, our behavior in that way. So much more complex. And then to apply system science to prioritize political, social, and other measures to prevent harm to health and reduce the health gradient. So using arguments about how interventions can support funding for vital services um, or influence international arguments or help countries collaborate in relation to, for example, supply chains or how you would um, try and um, incentivize healthier versus unhealthier products. And you can see very briefly on this slide the universities that are involved in the UK. We also have a Professor Sharon Friel um, who worked with Sir Michael Marmot, who many of you will have heard of, who on the social determinants of health, who is now in Australia and she's assisting us, particularly in two of our work packages. Importantly, and this was the exciting element for me and colleagues of UKPRP, is that unlike our previous consortia, we could bring our partners into our research and have them as active and equal um, participants in the work. And you can see we have the main uh, alliances on alcohol, obesity and tobacco in the UK. We have an international alliance working on NCDs. Importantly, we have our Colleagues of Poverty Alliance in Scotland, an umbrella organization for many smaller charities and community organizations working to reduce poverty. We have the main public health agencies in Great Britain. And we also have a company that works with data for retailers. And Neve, I'm sure, will touch on their role. And finally, just on a spectrum, before I move on to very briefly some examples of our recent work. Um, we have eight work packages. Again, the font is very small here, so wouldn't be able to uh, expect you to see all of this. But moving from system science to corporate conduct, generating new data, I'll give you some examples. Um, our uh, economist colleagues at the University of Sheffield conducting economic analysis uh, at the University of Edinburgh and Geosciences, Neve and her colleague, Professor Jamie Pierce on shaping the environment looking at the effectiveness of policies when they're introduced, an important work package on mental health and inequalities under investigated in relation to commercial determinants, and importantly, governance and health equity and how we can build more resilient systems. And cutting across all of this, we have something called the Spectrum Academy, which involves all of our early career researchers and in-kind contributions from the universities through PhD studentships. And this group have an opportunity to access training, to um, organize peer-based learning and engage with others so that we're building a strong uh, cohort of uh, early career researchers who will then go on to make a contribution in relation to our current work, but also importantly in the future to reduce the burden of non-communicable diseases. So examples of our recent work. I just chose three and there are a number of others. So on the generating new data, since 2006, CRUK and indeed others have funded the Smoking Toolkit, most recently entirely funded by CRUK, which is a monthly survey of smokers from a representative survey of the population um, and those who've recently quit also vapors. Um, and the wonderful thing about the toolkit is because it's monthly, you're able to track changes in real time and look um, at what is happening in the environment and how that might affect smoking behavior. Um, and we've wanted for many years actually to extend it to devolved nations and Spectrum gave us the opportunity to do that for Scotland and Wales. 
And this just shows you, we start, we were a bit delayed because of the pandemic, but we started to collect data in the autumn of last year. Um, and this is just some of the early results looking at smoking prevalence in Scotland and also motivation to quit, which declined through some periods in the pandemic. There may have been some slight stalling in reductions in prevalence, not surprising when people were dealing with public health restrictions and we're looking at that in more detail and will allow us to compare between the nations, draw conclusions and importantly for my colleagues in Scottish government, gives them data which is far more rapid, accessible and responsive than for example, the Scottish Health Survey that reports annually. And we're doing the same for alcohol. We also did a study during the pandemic looking specifically at the um, activities of unhealthy com commodity producers to profit from the pandemic, basically. I don't know how many of you saw the really quite shocking childhood obesity figures that were produced last week for England, historic rises. And I think it's pretty obvious when schools were shut, opportunities for interaction were reduced, physical activity may have declined for some and not for others. But importantly, food producers spent huge amounts of money marketing easily accessible, deliverable products and others during the pandemic. And that has influenced not only ch childhood diet, but for adults as well. So we picked up examples of that and we looked particularly, and um, we also looked at gambling and, and other um, industries. And there are many examples of where companies engaged in marketing campaigns, corporate social responsibility, shaping policy debates, and also having an opportunity to foster partnerships with governments and NGOs. And we um, had some coverage or a, an article in the BMJ about the report and also some press coverage. This is a crowdfunding study where we have volunteers who provide examples and collect data for us using templates. And it's actually ongoing. Um, so I think we'll be able to see in the fullness of time what's actually happened during this period. And then finally, uh, a two-year project that we've just completed. Uh, UK CTAS produced an independent alcohol strategy called Health First, that is the um, manifesto for the Alcohol Health Alliance. So we do have done a similar thing for the Obesity Health Alliance. And there are advantages to producing independent strategies separate from government, which allow uh, clinicians, academics, and advocates, uh, people from the charity uh, sector, NGOs, to come together to look at the evidence we've conducted rapid systematic reviews and then we made a whole series of recommendations we also engaged with people living with obesity with different communities and uh, got their views around different policies and interventions and this will provide a, a focus for the oha looking ahead so that they can continue to make the case for change and arguably we think that overweight and obesity is really you know, one of the biggest challenges for public health at the current time, and Spectrum certainly uh, keen to make its contribution to uh, how we can address that. So finally, I just want to highlight some opportunities within the current context, and then we'll hand over to Neve because I know I'm running out of time. I think there are things that are uh, opportunities now for uh, this community, the prevention and public health community that we need to seize. There may be a better understanding of public health within the population. I think there is, even if it's not always popular. There may be improvements in health literacy for some groups and not others. There's engagement with a public health system that's unprecedented, testing and uh, vaccines, possible opportunities to connect with many more groups on public health issues via the new technologies that we're using or adapted technologies. Um, there's also uh, collective efforts that have occurred, which I think we can learn from, and, and certainly the charity sector is doing that. We've seen extensive state intervention in human behavior for health protection. Will the governments be have more of an appetite to do that for other health issues? Will they be more accepting? Or does it mean they'll be less tolerant of ongoing intervention and want the state to step back? And will economic priorities include fewer constraints on unhealthy producers, um, uh, to, which will actually undermine public health in the months and years to come? So just to highlight, we've ru currently running two courses, one on nicotine tobacco and one on alcohol. Um, and I just started teaching on that yesterday. And I just want to comment, it's great to see people in person, very distant and secure venue, well ventilated. Um, but I think our delegates are benefiting as those of us contributing to the course are on, on having some of that back up and running. And we're running these knowledge exchange courses annually on nicotine tobacco and on alcohol. And that's just to sincerely thank all the funders uh, of UKPRP for this opportunity and all our, all our partners and members. Back to you, David. Thank you very much indeed, Linda, uh, for that fantastic talk.
and for uh, landing it perfectly on time as well, uh, exemplary work. Um, so now it gives me great pleasure to um, pass us over to Professor Neve Short. Uh, Neve's a Professor of Health Geographies and co-director of the Centre for Environment, Society and Health. Um, her research considers how the environment shapes our health, our health behaviours and uh, the resulting health inequalities. Um, Neve, uh, over to you. Uh, great, David. Thank you. I am just going to share my screen. OK, so good afternoon. I am here to talk with you today about one of the work packages in Spectrum that Linda has kindly um, explained. And in particular, I want to talk about some of the recent work that we have been doing on tobacco availability. This work looks at the availability of unhealthy commodities within our neighbourhoods, and we're looking at tobacco uh, food and um, alcohol in particular. But today I just want to set, talk about some of the recent work on tobacco. So I'm going to begin with outlining the pathways from availability to harm. So why would we, would we be interested in looking at availability in the first instance? I'm going to provide you with a little summary of the research evidence base before moving on to talk about the policy opportunities that we may have to reduce availability but as Linda also mentioned, there are, of course, barriers to policy change. So I want to mention some of the barriers to reducing the availability that exist. So first of all, the pathways from availability to harm. So I'm a geographer, so I'm interested in the environments from that we, we live in. As David mentioned earlier, um, thinking about the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. And with these conditions, I'm particularly concerned with the environments and the neighbourhoods that we move between and around on a day to day basis. We know that we're hoping to meet the challenges of the tobacco end game, and I would argue that in order to do that, then we need to radically alter our toxic environments. And of course, the World Health Organization has suggested that there are various ways in which we can do that through availability of unhealthy commodities the promotion of unhealthy commodities and the price of unhealthy commodities. So as part of this research package, we're particularly interested in availability and we're also focusing on a price element as well. How does availability impact upon our behaviours and upon the NCDs that we have talked about today? It's argued in the literature that there are various ways in which availability impacts upon uh, health outcomes. And it's generally through three channels. So the availability increases the supply within a neighbourhood and therefore makes it easily accessible. So that links to tobacco related outcomes such as increased smoking and reduced quit attempts. It's also argued that tobacco availability may influence the price of unhealthy commodities. So where we see uh, a cluster or a high volume of these retailers, we may see competition between them and therefore there may be price discounts, for example, between the different commodities. Also, in areas where there's increased availability, some of the norms around these unhealthy commodities may be shifted. So if we see tobacco and alcohol, for example, sold alongside everyday commodities such as bread and milk, then perhaps children and young people will see these commodities as, as OK and they become normalised. And then this shifts our perceptions of these commodities and in turn our behaviours. So those are the ways in which it is argued that tobacco availability or alcohol availability will shape our health outcomes. So is there a research evidence base for this? Uh, so much of the research evidence that exists focuses on three areas, particularly around um, smoking. So in areas where there uh, is high retailer availability, we can often see social and spatial inequalities in a minute. Increased adult smoking and reduced cessation, so weakened quit attempts. <coughs> Excuse me. And we also see youth smoking and initiation. And by initiation, I mean that young people are, are trying these products out. So you know they're, they're more likely to, to, to try smoking, to see what it's like. And then, of course, we know that that has an impact upon um, continued smoking in later life. So the social and spatial availability of tobacco. So there's a, a vast international evidence base to show that 
in area there is greater availability of tobacco in areas where, for example, there are more disadvantaged populations. And this has been measured in, for example, the United States, in Germany, in Australia, in New Zealand, uh, in England, and in Scotland. And we know that this has been measured against various measures of disadvantage, including income or socioeconomic status, uh, race, and ethnicity. So in areas where we see a grid of tobacco outlets, and we know that this is a problem because we also know that smoking rates are higher in areas of greater disadvantage. In Scotland, this well, we have looked at this for both tobacco and alcohol. This graph. Sorry, I'm not quite sure what happened um, there. This graph shows the percentage of the population that are income deprived uh, within Scotland. So we can see that as we move into areas of higher income deprivation, we're also seeing a greater availability of tobacco retailers. There are other ways of looking at this, and as we move towards our, our thinking, towards thinking about the tobacco game, one of the most important things is that we prevent young people from taking up smoking. So to what extent are children exposed in Scotland? And to do this, we've looked at GPS data from the Children in Scotland survey. So we're able to track the children for over a week to see, to measure their exposure to tobacco and to look to see whether or not these children are living in more deprived or more affluent households. And what we find is that children in Scotland on average are exposed to about 23 minutes of tobacco retailers uh, per week, but that there's a really strong socioeconomic gradient in this, with children from the most deprived areas set having seven times more exposure than children in the more affluent areas. And what's important about this is that this reveals a much stronger gradient than if we just look at neighbourhoods alone. So when we look at where people actually go and how people move throughout their neighbourhoods, we can see that the socioeconomic gradient in exposure is much greater. Well, why does this matter and what does the evidence base tell us about why this matters? Research that we've done has shown that adolescents who live in areas where there is a high availability of tobacco have a greater odds or greater likelihood of having ever smoked or current smoking. And also adults who live in areas with higher availability have a greater chance of being a current smoker and a lower chance of, of being an ex-smoker. So quick are are not as successful in neighborhoods with a high availability of tobacco. So what can we do about that? And what are the policy opportunities that would allow us to reduce tobacco availability within our neighborhoods? There are different ways in which we might want to think about reducing the availability of tobacco. For example, we might want to protect child spaces. We might want to reduce the sales of tobacco by different retailer type, limit the hours of sales, such as has been done in Scotland with alcohol. We might want some spatial restrictions. So for example, we might want to say that we can only have tobacco outlets within 300 metres of each other. Or we might want to introduce a licensing scheme. And different things have been applied in, in different contexts. And there's a, a, a website there, the tobacco control laws, that shows us what has been done internationally. So what we did um, recently was to think about these um, potential policy scenarios and we worked with our project partners um, within Spectrum to think about what these policy scenarios might be and we tried to simulate them across Scotland. So we, we looked at three broad types um, of restricting tobacco outlets in child spaces such as around schools or around playgrounds, of restricting tobacco sales to specific types of retailers, for example only to pharmacies where they might also give out cessation advice or only in supermarkets where we know that children are less likely to purchase tobacco. And we also looked at spatial restrictions such as this minimum distance between retailers. And the maps here will show you what the what it does to the communities um, within when we remove some of these tobacco retailers. So what we can see um, in the top of the quadrant is the business as usual model in Glasgow. And then we can see what happens and how many retailers we would lose um, selling tobacco if we restrict sales within 300 metres of schools 
in off license only, for example, and if we have a minimum distance between the retailers as well. So what happens here? So what we can see is that eight out of the 12 policies that we looked at reduced tobacco outlet density by more than 50%. So we saw a huge reduction in the availability of tobacco across Scotland. But what we're particularly interested in also are the inequalities of this. So we know from the from the graph I presented earlier is that there are huge inequalities in the availability of tobacco in Scotland. And we want to make sure that any intervention that we would think about would be very careful about any intervention generated inequalities so that we wouldn't inadvertently make these inequalities larger. So we also looked at the absolute size of the inequalities that each of these policy scenarios would implement. So here we see the tobacco outlet density in deprivation quintiles across each of these policies. And we can see that all of the policies, except for a few of them, have managed to reduce the tobacco outlet density in the most deprived areas to close to or below what it would have been in the least deprived areas. So we have to think about these inequalities as well with regards to these interventions. So it's all very well and good thinking about these interventions and the policy oh. scenarios that we might want to implement to help us get towards the tobacco end game. But as Linda mentioned, there are barriers to um, going forward with any public health intervention. And Linda mentioned uh, public support, political will and industry objections. And we would argue that all of these are barriers to reducing availability. We, we want to have the public on board. We want the politicians to be willing to implement these um, brave, I suppose, public health interventions. And we want to try to counteract any industry objections or come up with evidence um, to show that, that what we're doing is required. So along with one of the project partners in Spectrum, the Retail Data Partnership, we have been working on looking at the industry claims regarding footfall. So one of the biggest arguments about reducing the availability of tobacco within our neighbourhoods is that tobacco is important to convenience stores and that the industry claims that it has high sales value, it drives footfall in these smaller stores, and it also drives significant secondary purchasing. So building on work that was done by Ash in England and their counter argument study several years ago, we wanted to explore this across Great Britain. And we wanted to explore the importance of tobacco sales within these small corner stores that are around all of our neighbourhoods. And we look, wanted to look at the value of the tobacco sales as well as the value of these secondary purchases. So if someone goes in to buy tobacco, um, then they might also buy bread and milk and a newspaper, for example. So we wanted to look at the value of those sales as well. And we also wanted to look at what happened, what's been happening over time. So in order to do that, we got data from 2016 and 2019 of all sales within these stores. So we had over um, 1,200 stores uh, across Britain. And what we have found um, is some of them graphed here, and this is currently under review. Um, first of all, the proportion of tobacco baskets or baskets selling tobacco has fallen from 24% of the total baskets sold in these corner stores in 2016 to 15% in 2019. So a relative decline of 47%. So we can see the tobacco sales are falling. They're falling quite rapidly. And they're falling faster than any other of these footfall drivers that I've graphed here. News and magazines, soft drinks, bread and confectionery. So for example, soft drinks have fallen by 10%, news by 25% as we all now get our news online, and um, bread by 0.1%. In 2016, the top three footfall drivers were soft drinks, tobacco and confectionery. And confectionery has now overtaken tobacco, and we could argue that there are issues with that that we could talk about separately. But the, the, the value of the tobacco baskets um, has halved within these stores over these three years. If we look then at turnover and the change in turnover within these stores, we can see that the proportion of the weekly turnover by tobacco has fallen by 8% from 47 to 39. This is at the same time, of course, that tobacco price has um, increased. So our next kind of analysis will be thinking about profits and, and, and tax. 
that we'll be doing as part of Spectrum with partners in Sheffield. But we've also looked at how this has changed within areas of deprivation. So whilst the importance of tobacco baskets is a little greater in deprived areas, it's really important to note that it's declined faster in these deprived areas as well. And the, the importance of non-tobacco baskets in the most deprived areas has grown faster. So these are arguments that we will get um, around reducing tobacco availability. So we're building the evidence base to show that the tobacco sales are falling and that perhaps by reducing availability, we can help these tobacco sales to fall even further. So what are the next steps then in supporting uh, policy development? So our current research priorities are how do we incentivize resale retailers to cease selling tobacco? And through that, we're going to work and speak to retailers and bring them along in survey and qualitative work. We're also in the middle of evaluating a potential tobacco licensing scheme and modeling fees using our sales data. We're also evaluating co-purchasing behaviors. So what do people buy when they go in to buy tobacco and or alcohol or highly processed foods? What has been bought together in a collection of baskets? And Linda also mentioned the smoking and alcohol toolkit. So we're, we've also been lucky to be able to add new questions to this, looking at the public acceptability of these policies aimed at reducing availability. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Neef. Um, perhaps if uh, if any of you can stay on camera and Linda can join us on camera, um, and I'll now uh, be taking questions. Um, so just a, a reminder to folks: if you can uh, submit any questions that you may have using the Slido platform, um, the links are in the meeting chat. Uh, I'm monitoring those, and uh, you've also got the opportunity to upvote questions that you like by clicking on the thumbs up, and I'll try and make sure that we uh, address the most popular ones. So, uh, Neve, Linda, thank you uh, very much for your fantastic talks, and we've had a lot of interest in the, uh, in the questions here. Um, we've got one uh, from Anonymous uh, asking um, whether there, there are interesting parallels, perhaps, between um, your work in the commercial um, determinants of health here with uh, parallels with the in industry involvement with climate change actions uh, and the interesting interplay of uh, drivers there. Um, have you looked at that uh, from, a, from a health lens at all? So maybe if I start and then Neve probably will have comments as a geographer, I'm sure, in this area. It's not it's not within um, Spectrum's core remit, as in, you know, we need to deliver on the uh, proposal that we submitted to UKPRP. But our networks are engaged in those debates and certainly during COP26 here in Scotland, it was very obvious that some of the same challenges about multilateral governance and these governance mechanisms internationally are entirely similar. So to give you one specific example, a COP9 has just taken place virtually in Geneva, which is the governance framework for the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the governance me mechanism, along with the World Health Assembly. And one of the historic challenges we've had at COP for tobacco is um, country delegations having climate, um, having uh, tobacco producers within their delegations or those who have links to the tobacco industry, even though there are rules and regulations around that, it's difficult to exclude them. COP26 or the climate COP has an even weaker framework for that. And I think the press picked up on the number of countries who had delegations that included fossil fuel um, representatives or those linked to the industry. So I think when you have those kinds of voices on an equal footing in a multilateral governance um, mechanism, it's really difficult. And I'm not saying that the outcomes of COP were directly affected by that, although some would argue that they were muddied, they muddied the water. I think that's an area where, particularly for Work Package 8, where we're looking at these international frameworks, there are actually real lessons from tobacco control, and um, you know, it's still the only global public health treaty. So I think we can make a contribution there. The other interesting thing um, about the whole debates around climate change is that health hasn't been given the prominence that it should. You know, climate change is a health issue. Um, and I think people are beginning to understand that to a greater degree, particularly during the pandemic. But maybe that's something that public health researchers as a group can contribute to. And the final point I'd make is that some of the literature on the techniques that industries use to influence policy is shared across these different producers. And, you know, we've certainly in the past, um, I mean, I've contributed to a chapter with a, a, a book that Naomi Oaks has written on these issues. Um, but I think we've got a lot to learn from the climate change community as well. Thanks. Good question. 
Sorry, Neve, did you want to add? Yeah, no, just that I, I, I fully agree with Linda on, on the shared learning. I'm going to keep my camera off. I'm sorry, I'm having bandwidth problems at the moment. Um, but also um, in relation to climate change, we, we also know that the UN Sustainable Development Goals have talked a lot about, about climate change. And I've just finished an analysis and writing a paper on the ways in which the unhealthy commodity industries, particularly alcohol and tobacco, are using these UN Sustainable Development Goals around their corporate social responsibility. So I think that it's really important that we look to the ways in which the, the industries are co-opting climate change as well as what we have seen them do with COVID-19. So there's much to learn from climate change, but there's also the ways in which the industries are engaging with climate change themselves. Yeah, no, no, I mean, those are clearly very important points. Um, we have another uh, uh, highly voted question here um, around uh, our, our changing environment. Um, are there any lessons from the pandemic for the policymakers concerned with the commercial determinants of health? Um, so as part of our part of our spectrum study, we're looking at alcohol sales before, during and supposed to be after the pandemic, but we're not yet in an after the pandemic world. But using the retail data partnership data, we're able to look at what happened to uh, alcohol sales uh, around this time, including what products people shifted to, what happened to the price of um, the commodities and, and what's happened as we've moved in and out of lockdown. I know that other colleagues such as uh, Neve Fitzgerald, who's also a part of Spectrum, uh, are looking at licensed premises and what happened in licensed premises before, during, after the pandemic. So I think there's a lot for us to learn in terms of like natural experiments with regards to COVID-19. And, and we know that some behaviour shifted um, during COVID-19. So we need to better understand how and in what ways these behaviours shifted and what um, whether or not we're returning to normal afterwards. Uh, Linda, I don't know if you want to say something about that. Yeah, just a broader point. I think if you look at the history of, of pandemics and global crises like global conflicts, of course, commercial actors are going to be, they're very entrepreneurial and they find an opportunity to make profits. And again, you know, in a UK level, we've seen some of the, the challenging decisions that have been made by governments around procurement and around which companies were given access and privileged um, in the supplies that we needed during the pandemic. And again, in tobacco control, if you look at DHSC and the devolved nations, there's very clear terms of engagement and information that they have to provide on their interactions with, for example, tobacco producers. And that's not the case in other areas. So I think Spectrum can contribute to a transparency agenda. And one of the papers that we're writing at the moment, which is not about the pandemic, but it relates to it, um, is, is, and this is to do with higher education, looking at the policies that universities across the UK have for engagement and funding from different industries, and whether there's a way that we can help with terms of engagement and conflicts of interest, and understanding, you know, in a more nuanced way what those are. Um, so I do think Spectrum has a contribution to make here, and I think the pandemic means we're probably reflecting on this even more than we would have been without it. Thank you both. Um, last in a, a trilogy of um, sort of more contextual uh, questions about the wider landscape, um, has, uh, does Brexit offer any opportunities um, for how we uh, interact with uh, policies around you know, these uh, commercial uh, determinants of ill health? Um, well, we, we could start on a really negative note. <laughs> I think my colleague Martha McCary wrote a really interesting piece in the BMJ, if you want to Google that, um, around about the time that the, um, you know, we left the EU on how Brexit was a real threat to public health, and that was losing access to some of the coordination mechanisms um, that we had through Europe. Now, I know for David's field and others, we were very concerned about the EMA and, and, and some of the other frameworks and organizations that we'd um, you know, worked with in the, in the past and, and also thinking about how drugs are produced and made available. And even, of course, some of the frameworks, as David, I'm sure, would attest that we need for clinical trials and, and other types of and discoveries, science, et cetera. Um, so there is quite a lot of negativity there, but I think we do need to be positive and recognize that the products we're dealing with, there's a global supply chain and there may be opportunities to partner with other countries. Um, I mean, Latin America has done some really innovative work around trying to promote healthier food environments and 
better supply chains. I'm thinking of Chile in particular, but other countries. Um, so we can learn from them. So there, there may well be um, advantages. The final point I'd make there, David, is to uh, commend or draw colleagues' attention to Petra, which is one of the UK PRP funded networks, which is looking at health and trade. And they're far more expert in these issues and actively thinking about Brexit than, than Spectrum is, but we, we do actively engage with them. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Linda. Um, and a question uh, perhaps here for Neve. Um, so we've got a, a cluster of questions around tobacco. Um, with regards to tobacco, tobacco availability, how can we be sure that uh, availability increases use rather than uh, reverse causation or a, a more complex relationship? Okay, yeah, so this is um, this is something that we have been asked uh, quite a lot with regards to it, and it's something that we're exploring at the moment. So we've got a um, alongside spectrum um, and kind of shared learning within it. We're looking at tobacco availability over time. So we are looking at the availability of tobacco in Scotland from 2010 to the present day to see the, the changes in availability within the neighbourhoods and to see whether or not this corresponds with any changes in behaviour. So we'll be able to get a little bit more causality. The other thing that we're doing is to create um, uh, estimated simulation of behaviours within small neighbourhoods across Scotland to allow us to get to the idea of excess supply and demand. So that will allow us to answer these questions about supply, supply and demand. I think though that that's all methodological and, and obviously really important to answer some of these limitations. But I think when we see that these unhealthy commodities are clogged in poorest neighbourhoods, then there are definite questions to be asked around social justice and around why that's happening and what that means and whether or not it's through the readily supply or as I talked about the normalization of these commodities and behaviors if it's normalized amongst young children uh, then and, that, and that's happening more so in more deprived areas then there are important questions to be asked around availability those methodological issues aside, which we're also getting up. Thank you, Neve. Um, and following up on the, the, the smoking theme, um, we have a question asking, uh, are you going to look at the smoke free UK by 2030 campaign? And uh, do you think that can be achieved? Um, so I'll let, I'll let Linda come in on this as well. So we are we're looking at the idea of the tobacco end game. So to get, you know, a low percentage of the population um, smoking as low as possible and the various ways in which we can get to that. And that's why we're looking at to um, the, the various different policy scenarios. Again, I'm going to go back to inequalities that we know that smoking rates are falling um, faster and have been for many years in more affluent areas compared to more deprived areas. And we're, what we're wanting to do really is close that gap between the most affluent and most deprived um, neighbourhoods. So whilst we're, we want to get to a whole population level of low smoking rates, we, we want to ensure that we're not widening any um, inequalities whilst we do that and that any intervention that we're thinking about, we're keeping an eye on these inequalities as to whether or not it's realistic, I'm an optimist. So I, um, I'm going to think that if we put the right policies in place, I'm hoping that we'll get there. But I'll let Linda come in on that. Well, we've made huge progress in recent years. And, um, you know, we have the second lowest rates of smoking in Europe now, going from the highest rates in the world in the 1950s. Um, so it does show that you can do this partnership between funders, policymakers and researchers generating evidence to inform action. Um, 2030, I think we've already achieved. So the definition is a, a smoking prevalence of 5% or below. We've already achieved that in the highest socioeconomic groups. As Neve says, the challenge is the inequalities. Um, I think it's an ambitious target. What I would say is that Spectrum is actively contributing to the, the tobacco control plan for England. Uh, we co-authored the All Parliamentary Party Groups report, which set out what some of the key policies would be. And we're working very closely with colleagues in the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities to really feed in that evidence in DHSC. And the Scottish government um, is just starting its plan for rejuvenating their tobacco control plan in contact with Public Health Wales within the, the um, consortium. So I think, I think we can help to feed in that evidence. And finally, those toolkits. I see there was another question, David, in the chat, I'll just take quickly. Uh, those toolkits will help. There was a question about the alcohol toolkit. 
So the alcohol toolkit, sorry, I didn't mention that. If you just Google alcohol toolkit for England, you can find the alcohol toolkit website that's been funded again by CRUK uh, for a number of years now within the program grant that my colleagues at UCL have for CREK. Um, and the Welsh and Scottish data, we've not got the websites up for the alcohol toolkit there yet, but they're underway. Thanks. And um, perhaps uh, one more on uh, smoking before we change topic. Um, this, this, this may be related to, to Neve's uh, work on, on the spatial uh, distribution of tobacco outlets. Um, has uh, your research or indeed uh, anyone else's that you're aware of looked at the impact of uh, closing of vape shops as non-essential uh, you know, during the pandemic and whether that uh, you know, reduction of access to e-cigarettes and vaping products, did that have an impact on smoking? Um, because, you know, the, the, I suppose they're positing that, you know, during that lockdown, if there was a time it was easier to get cigarettes than it was to get e-cigs. Yeah, so we haven't looked at vaping in particular as part of our work yet, but we have just begun to gather the data on the availability of vape stores. And, and what we're particularly interested in is whether or not um, vape stores have displaced um, some tobacco stores. So are we seeing um, some tobacco stores closing and maybe vape stores opening up in those areas and, and how... And, and, and also looking at the inequalities of the availability of vape stores as well. But of course, people don't just buy their vapes in vape stores. There's the kind of online availability of vaping materials and also vape, vaping materials are bought in uh, in corner shops as well. So we also have the data on, on vaping sales over the pandemic. Um, so we are also looking at that. We're wanting to look at the sales um, of vapes uh, over over COVID-19 and we'll be using our, our our data from our partner to do that but we haven't looked at it as yet so yeah it's, it's a it's a really neat idea though to explore that. Mm. Um, an interesting question here from uh, Rachel from the Association for Young People's Health who um, suggests that data on smoking and alcohol prevalence in specifically in young people has decreased over time and that um, deprivation doesn't show clear inequalities um, in, in young people in uh, smoking and alcohol use. Um, why do uh, you think that might be? Well, so there's two points there and they're both really important. They're, you're right about the decrease in data. So the smoking, drinking, drug use in young people survey was paused in England and replaced with a smaller data set and in fact not collected at all for a period. Um, you know, we have seen some of the data sources for young people in the devolved nations decline as well, and then totally disrupted by the pandemic. So we are in a bit of a, in fact, the child healthy weight data I mentioned for England won't even, wasn't even collected in Scotland during the pandemic. So we won't actually know for a while what the impacts have been here. And I recognize, I saw that question, the limitations of those data, but at least the data is consistent so you can compare year to year. Um, Actually, I would slightly disagree on the second point. There are clear um, differences by deprivation for smoking in young people, even in the data that we have. But you're right, for alcohol, it's not as clear. Um, what you see commonly with alcohol, there's people on the line who are far more expert than I am on this, is that alcohol consumption is not necessarily higher in lower socioeconomic groups always, but alcohol health harms are. Um, so you have this weird phenomenon where more affluent groups with more resources might have more access to alcohol. But actually, because of a whole range of complex circumstances, the harms uh, appear um, in, in lower groups. So I know we've run out of time, so I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. Um, so uh, in a moment, we'll, we'll wrap up and I'll pass on uh, to um, the, we'll tell you about the next webinar. Uh, just one, one last little question for the two of you as a parting thought, perhaps. If you could uh, click your fingers and make you know one change in uh, government policy around the commercial determinants of ill health what would it be for each of you um, i'm happy to go uh, i would i would like to see us focusing on children and young people and and on inequalities so with regards to availability i would like to look at examples elsewhere where sales and advertising and promotions are prohibited around child spaces, around schools and playgrounds, and also in sports that attract young people, so rugby and football matches and things like that. So I think to address children and young people and then in turn inequalities is what we need to do. And finally, for me, if there was one thing which is systems, David, I would look at our impact assessments and what's required across governments and why producers are still equal stakeholders. Um, with others on some of these public health topics where I think often 
we really need to understand that the evidence and the views that they submit are there to derail or delay the policies, not to help form them. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, that is fantastic. Thank you both so much for your contributions um, to this webinar and your, your talks and your, uh, the fantastic discussion. And I hope that uh, all the participants uh, listening and watching at home have enjoyed that discussion. Um, in the chat box, uh, the team have posted links to the previous webinars in this session, so you can watch uh, replays of those. Um, the next webinar uh, coming up uh, on the 13th of December is around making healthy decisions on urban development and planning. Um, so I hope you'll join us all then uh, for that next in the in this series of fantastic discussions. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you from the organisers and see you next time.